Good morning, everyone. My name is Brandon. I'm one of the pastors here at Legacy. Whether you're joining us online, on television, or right here in the sanctuary, thanks so much for spending just a little bit of your Thanksgiving weekend with us. And Happy New Year. Now, I do know my calendar. I know it's not January 1st, but November 27th. But for us Christians, whenever we get to the season of Advent, that is the start of our new year. This is the Christian New Year. Advent, as we've heard, means anticipation. It means visit and coming. We remember two visits every single Advent. The first one you likely know well. We remember Jesus' first coming as a baby 2,000 years ago, Mary and Joseph, angels and shepherds, and all that. And we also look forward to his second coming. We wait for the time when Jesus returns to complete the work begin at his resurrection, when the new heaven and new earth arrive, when everything sad will become untrue, undone, and redeemed. We look back and remember the longing of the Jewish people for a Messiah, a Savior, and we remember our own longing, our own desires, our own need for forgiveness, salvation, and a new beginning. Longing and waiting, they are central in the celebration of Advent. I couldn't help but think of this scene. This is a superhero who's trying to live undercover, just going through his day job, and he encounters a tricycle kid who longs and waits patiently in the film The Incredibles. Longing, anticipation, all of that is central in waiting for Jesus to return again. How long, O Lord, must we wait for you to make everything new, to make everything sad untrue? How long, O Lord, must we wait for our deepest hurts and pains and regrets to be made new? How long, O Lord, must we witness so much pain and suffering and heartache near and far? Just as the Jewish people waited for the Savior's arrival, we wait for Jesus' return to put the world the way it was supposed to be with no more pain or suffering or death ever again. We long for so many things at so many different ages. When we are sick, we're dealing with unending pain and treatments. We long for health and strength and vibrancy. We long for those we love that we're, who are ill to get better. When there is tension and strife and frustration, perhaps between parents and children or in romantic relationships, we long for trust and clear communication and love. When our jobs and our careers are uncertain and unstable, we long for security and confidence. In your life today, where does your longing come from? Your own actions, the actions of others, or just because you're human living a life here on earth? Advent reminds us that Jesus meets us not only in our longings and our pain, but on our way, uh, <laughs> but today, but we're on our way to a new heaven and a new earth where longing and waiting ends. Welcome, friends, to the season of Advent. In this season, we're going to take a deep dive into some of the most sung, the most well-known songs of this season. Now, if it's the songs you only hear in church or hear on the radio during this six-week period and no other, unless you're one of those people who listen to Christmas music not in season. So scandalous of you. <laughs> now, coming up first is the only true Advent song that most people know. Technically, we should only be singing Advent songs until Christmas starts, and then after Christmas, we sing Silent Night and I'll come all ye faithful and joy to the world. But it'd be a quiet month of singing at church because none of the other Advent tunes really became popular. They didn't really connect with people, and we don't know them. We just didn't learn them. They didn't stick. Up first today is the Advent tune, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Now, the original lyrics were first written in Latin 1,200 years ago. Let me say that again. 1,200 years ago. Can you imagine some of the music we sing and enjoy now enduring until the 33rd century? People still going to be singing Taylor Swift, reminded of the time she was the entire top 10 list, every single one of her songs for a period? Will Grandma Got Ran Over by a Reindeer make any sense in the year 3200? Will people ask, why were reindeer driving cars and so hostile to the elderly? Will Olivia Rodrigo, Ed Sheeran, Beyonce, Jay-Z, and Zach Bryan still be played? 1,200 years is a long time. This is an ancient tune we continue to sing. Now, fun fact, the 1892 Anglo-Saxon version and translation of this song actually inspired much of the Lord of the Rings. Names like Arendelle and Middle-earth, they are found in that version. 
Before this was an Advent song, it was likely sung at a funeral. It makes sense. It's got this minor key that we sing it with it. It carries both sadness and expectation just in the music, with this feeling of loss and longing for the day that Jesus returns again to make everything sad untrue. Now, when it became an Advent tune, this was meant to be sung one verse a day for seven days leading up to Christmas. Most of the lyrics that we have now come from the book of Isaiah in your Old Testament in your Bible. Isaiah was a teenager, just 18 years old, when he was called to be God's prophet to the Israelites a long time ago. It was quite the calling at a young age, just at 18. And we are called, no matter our age, to use our gifts and our talents in service to Jesus. It can be a whole career that we serve Jesus, but it can also just be using our expertise in service to God's kingdom. Don't ignore the Holy Spirit itch. Don't ignore the Holy Spirit itch if the Spirit is tugging on your heart today. Now, the first term to understand is in the title. What on earth does Emmanuel mean? We don't use that word anywhere else. We're going to go to Isaiah because that's where this book comes from. You can follow along with me in your Bible, on your favorite device, or on the screen with me. Now, Isaiah spends a chunk of his time giving us clues, indications, directions on what this long-awaited Messiah, Savior, would do and would be for the Israelites. What we have in Isaiah are his oracles. They're his spoken messages given when he lived 700 years before Jesus came. Now today, we wouldn't call them oracles, we would just call them sermons. These are a collection of Isaiah's sermons that he preached. Let's jump in Isaiah 7, verse 14. All right then, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She'll give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. It is so very helpful when the Bible gives us the meaning of the word right in the text. It makes biblical interpretation, my job, so much easier. Emmanuel means God is with us, just like we are with each other. God walks with us through our highs and our lows, joys and sorrows, our laughter and our pain. When Isaiah spoke, Isaiah was still looking ahead to Emmanuel's arrival. However, 700 years later, once Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, receives this dream to take Mary as his wife, in spite of what everyone would see as Mary cheating on her, Matthew writes these words. All this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She'll give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Sounds like an echo? Word for word, syllable for syllable, Matthew quotes Isaiah. Why? Because Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. If you want to know what God is like, look to Jesus. If someone says God did something and it doesn't match up with how Jesus lives, acts, and speaks, then God didn't do it. Jesus is God in the flesh. If you want to to express happiness, sadness, anger, and grief to God, give it to Jesus in prayer, in meditation, Because Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, walking with us still today through everything we journey with in this life. That means in our longing, God is with us. Whatever your longing, your anxiety, your suffering, we can find hope that God is with us and a future filled with hope and life and love is coming. You will not be tired forever. You will not be weak forever. You will not be anxious and fearful forever. You will not be separated from your loved ones forever. God is coming to save you. God is coming to save me. That's the point of remembering not just Jesus' arrival as a baby, but his return when everything is made right again. Advent gives us this glimpse into the future by remembering the past. Advent gives us this glimpse into the future by remembering the past. This glimpse helps us so we can endure whatever longing or pain or suffering we have in this present moment. It can give us strength Give strength for the tired, for the weak to keep going. The anxious and fearful find peace knowing the end of the story. Just as Jesus came the first time in a manger, he will come again to restore everything and everyone. Let's take a look at some of the other verses of this song, other imagery ripped right from Isaiah that points to Jesus. Here's the first verse. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. 
that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. So know what Emmanuel means, but what does Son of God? In ancient times, Son of God could mean many different things. Romans could hear and think Jesus being called Son of God, and they think he was a usurper to the throne, that he was going to take over Caesar. But our Bibles, it primarily connects back to King David. God promised David that someone from his family line would be on the throne forever. In fact, the Messiah would come from David's line. So Son of God is primarily a shorthand for the Messiah, for the long-awaited Jewish king. Notice in this verse that Israel is in captivity. Shortly after Isaiah is... Isaiah preaches, Israel is exiled, they're carried far away from their homeland, most never to return again. They're ripped away, not only from their homes, from the place they believe they need to be to worship God. Here, the author of the song notes, even in deep despair, even in their mourning, there's reason to hope. There's reason to hope because the Son of God is coming. The Son of God will appear. The Son of God will rescue Israel. Even though Israel got themselves into the situation, God is still sending the Messiah to rescue them. As a matter of fact, God will come to be with us in Jesus. Friends, even in the middle of the messes of our own making, giving in to our own desires to sin that destroys our relationship and connection with God, God still wants to rescue us. How incredible is that? God doesn't want to give up on us. God wants to redeem us to make us whole again. If there's one takeaway of Israel's journey with God, it's that no matter how many times Israel got themselves into trouble, God was always, always willing to come to the rescue. They simply have to ask. We simply have to ask, and Jesus will rescue us, redeem us, restore our connection with God. So no matter what you're going through today, there is reason to hope. There's always reason to hope Jesus is coming again. Jesus will appear in the flesh again. Jesus wants to rescue us in the future, and he wants to rescue us today. For it hangs us up or holds us back to the full life he wants for all of us. Jesus wants to rescue us just like he eventually rescued Israel from exile and returned them to their homeland. Take whatever you've got to Jesus, whatever burden in prayer, and let Emmanuel sit with you, God with us sit with you, and heal and direct you on whatever is next in your life. Here's another verse of the song. O come thou root of Jesse's tree, an ensign of thy people be. Before the ruler silent fall, all peoples on thy mercy call. The one that always strikes me here is, what is a root of Jesse's tree? Not language that we use. Now, the author of this song is pulling again from Isaiah and from King David's life. Jesse was David's father. And since God promised the Messiah would come from the line of David, the root of Jesse's tree, it's just a very poetic way of saying, oh, come, Messiah, come make things right again. Fulfill your promise that the Messiah would come from Jesse and David's family. This is the scripture from Isaiah chapter 11. Out of the stump of David's family would grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Jesus is indeed from the line of David, fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy, the Messiah will come from David's house. Another verse from the song picks up on the second part of the passage, that the Messiah will have the spirit of the Lord on him. O come thou wisdom from on high, and order all things far and nigh. To us the path of knowledge show, and cause us in her ways to go. They didn't know it then, but we know now Jesus was and is God, the very embodiment of wisdom and understanding, and of counsel and might in human form. I don't think we feel the same desire and passion for wisdom as the ancients did, those in Isaiah's time and those in Jesus' day. Looking to the internet, to social media feeds, I see so many people just wanting to be heard, to be loud, to say the extreme thing, to get attention, but not nearly as many people seeking wisdom and life beyond themselves and their own limited earthly experience. 
In Jesus' day especially, the most thing people wanted, the thing so many people searched for, was wisdom. They wanted knowledge beyond themselves to live a life full of meaning and purpose and hope. Wisdom in the first century was defined like this, the skill of living well, making the right decisions which prolong and promote life and health and happiness even in a dark world. Who doesn't want that still today? I want to make the right decisions. I want to do things that prolong and promote life, not just for me, but for my neighbor as well. In Jesus' day, they gained wisdom by listening to parables and stories, riddles and other forms of speech offered by Jewish teachers. Wisdom became associated with things like eternal life, resurrection, and salvation. Wisdom brings salvation. Wisdom brings eternal life. Might sound familiar. It wasn't uncommon to hear phrases like, wisdom is the light of the world. Wisdom is the way, the truth, and the life. Wisdom is the true vine. That might sound familiar. The pursuit of wisdom was a big deal. And what do we find in our Bibles? Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Jesus says, I am the true vine. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You want wisdom, you want life to the full, there is wisdom standing right there, breathing in the flesh in Jesus. You want to live well, you want to make right decisions, follow the way of the carpenter from Nazareth. You want eternal life, resurrection, and salvation, follow Jesus. From Isaiah's day to Jesus' day, the ancients wanted wisdom, and the Messiah came, God in the flesh, in Jesus to be wisdom, and to show the way to life then and still today. The Messiah who was in his wisdom that came through David's family line to bring us hope and healing and life, no matter what we might be struggling with in this present moment. Now the final verse shows us that this song is about both Advents, his first coming and his second. O come, desire of nations, bind all people in one heart and mind. From dust thou brought us forth to life. Deliver us from earthly strife. Man, don't we long for the day that earthly strife and violence come to an end. Our news broadcasts and feeds are full of nothing of local violence, national violence, roars and wars and rumors of wars breaking out. We long for a permanent peace that Jesus' second return will finally bring, the renewal, redemption, and resurrection of not only our loved ones that have gone on to be with Jesus, but a new heaven, a new earth, a renewed place where God walks with us. There will be no more crying or death or pain ever again. That's what our Bible teaches us. That's where the song directs our hearts and our focuses to. Our task is not to sit passively and wait. We actively wait, getting involved where we see people in pain and suffering and in need of the hope, healing, and wholeness that Jesus brings. Advent reminds us of this longing deep inside of us, and we know we're not going to sit in our longing forever. Jesus will return. God will make everything right. God will make everything sad untrue. It's why after every verse in the song, we sing, Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. In that minor key in the midst of our own pain and strife and not quite wholeness, we still rejoice. We give thanks for all the blessings in our lives just like we did this past Thanksgiving holiday. We rejoice in a world that seems to be filled with nothing but pain and violence and strife. And there are still people seeking wisdom, following Jesus, being light to the dark places. There are reasons to rejoice even in the middle of our own pain. Because Emmanuel, God is with us today. Emmanuel, God is with us tomorrow. Because Emmanuel, God will return to make crying and suffering and pain and death disappear forever to make everything sad untrue. We actively wait, just like that tricycle kid in The Incredibles, waiting for something amazing. He got to see this. We bring our longings to Emmanuel, God with us. We rejoice in the middle of an imperfect world, working to bring light to the dark. And we look forward to the day in the new heaven and the new earth when we can say, that was totally wicked. Welcome, friends, to Advent. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, in the middle of our longing, it hurts in the middle of our rejoicing and sorrow. Help us to see us with you, God with us. Whether through other people, through our times of prayer and meditation, through your word, or in the amazing world you've created for us, may we see you are indeed Emmanuel walking with us through it all. It's in your resurrected Savior's name we pray together. 
Amen. Thank you.